Micah 7, 8. You'll recognize this first. Most of you will. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I want to speak to you on the subject of resilience. God bless you. Please be seated. I've taught this theme at least twice in our church. Most recently in 2016 in Family Matters. Tonight I'll take a considerably different approach, different content. content. I'm going to focus on the book of Micah a little bit more. But the idea is the same when you think and talk about resilience and the concept in the Bible. Resilience is not a Bible word. When I was a kid, we had a toy that consisted of a paddle and a ball connected by a rubber band. It was called, appropriately, a paddle ball. And no matter how hard you hit the ball, within reason, the ball would come rebounding back to you. It was resilient. It would come back to you. It was possible and still is possible to miss the paddle and hit your face. I ordered this paddle ball. It arrived yesterday. I practiced a little bit with it yesterday and decided that I would not show off tonight. It came in a two-pack before church. No, you really don't. Before church, I was hoping maybe some spiritual gift had come to me between yesterday and today. So I, I tried the paddle ball out in my office, and it was a fail. Now, I know how people are, and some of you right now are wanting me to ask for volunteers to come to the platform and show us how it's done. I'm not going to do that. I don't mind embarrassing myself, but I really don't want to be humiliated in front of all of our children that are in here tonight. So after church, after the altar, after the spirit has departed, if you would like to uh, try your hand at the paddle ball, you can. But it has this elasticity. That's what makes it resilient. Ball is rubber, but the rubber band uh, doesn't break. It's not a string. It's made of, of rubber or some type of rubber material. So it bounces back. I have seen people who were very brittle. And uh, when life hit them, they went flying somewhere into the cosmos never to return. And they were brittle when they hit and splatted and plopped. And I've also seen people go through some of the most unspeakable grief in their life. Difficult situations that we cannot even fathom. And they have the ability in them, I believe, that is given by God and cultivated by spiritual growth, they have the ability to bounce back. Uh, when we say resilience, it is the power or ability to return to the original form or position after being bent, compressed, or stretched. Resilience is an elasticity. It's the ability to rebound after you've been bounced away in life. In life, resilience is the ability to bounce back from failure, adversity, and hardship. Resilience is the ability to get up again after you've fallen or have been knocked down. The person who is resilient may be knocked down, but they just keep getting back up again. The Bible gives us a little encouragement along this line in Proverbs 24, 16. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Now I know that it is possible for us to sin and God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we confess and forsake our sins. But Proverbs is not talking about Falling into sin. In fact, if you read the context of Proverbs 24, it speaks of not a wicked man not laying wait to go attack a just man and knock him down. There is this warning that if you go knock down a just man, he's just going to get back up again. You can knock him down seven times, but he's resilient and he's going to rise back up again. Rejoice not when thine enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, 
lest the Lord see it and it displease him and he turns away his wrath from him. You may have an enemy. You shouldn't maybe, but if you have an enemy that's a really bad person, Proverbs 24 teaches that you shouldn't rejoice when the bad guy gets in trouble or because of your wrath against that person. God may not like your wrath and he may avert the punishment. That's what Proverbs 24, 18 says. Now, I grew up on Proverbs. I want to throw this in for good measure, not part of my message. But I just felt recently that I need to return to reading a proverb a day. So I'm going to try to do that over and over. Proverbs is a book of practical wisdom. And if you think you're wise and you really need to read Proverbs, because you're probably not, and it will be a blessing to you. The principle of resilience is in the Bible in many places. And the Bible encourages us that by grace and by grit, and I say the title of that Bible lesson from a few months ago, on purpose, because you can't expect God to do it all if you're not willing to do your best, but God does not expect you to do what you cannot do. So He gives grace to the humble, and if you will be determined to be resilient, God will give you the grace if you will provide the grit, if you will make up your mind that by the grace of God, you will never let anything cause you to stumble and be lost, God will always allow you to bounce back even when you've been knocked down. Now, I taught an entire series on message, a message to, messages to the dispersed church. But I want to remind you that struggle and Suffering should not be strange to us. 1 Peter 4.12 Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as some strange thing has happened unto you. But rejoice. Now, the Bible often attaches rejoicing with suffering. Rejoicing with trouble. They don't really go together outside of the Christian life. But even in times of struggle, suffering, and trial, we have a reason to rejoice. So the Apostle Peter writes, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. So here's the revelation. Life is not easy. How about that for church on Wednesday night? We live in a hostile environment of sickness and sin. In Noah's day, I've been thinking about this lately. In Noah's day, the Bible said that the earth was filled with violence. God said in Genesis 6.13, said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come up before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Noah's day was violent. Now I know Jesus said, that is, in the days of Noah, shall, so shall it be in the coming of the days of the Son of Man. But he was referring to life rocking on as normal. They ate and drank, married, were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and took them all away. Life rocked on. But also in Noah's day, it was violent. And we live in a violent world. And it seems that now justice has fallen in the street. and Truth has turned away backward. And, and you know, there's kind of a turning away from from ungodliness and sin and lawlessness, which only kind of genders more violence in our world. Our world is a lot like Noah's day. And in addition to all of that, we happen to have an enemy of our soul, Satan, who is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we live in an environment where we need to not be naive and spiritually whistle in the dark as if there's nothing there. Amen? We don't rejoice knowing that our lives will be marked with struggle and trouble and trials and difficulty. But we have hope by what Jesus said in John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me, Jesus said, you might have peace. In the world... You shall have tribulation. Notice what Jesus said. In me you can have peace. Because in the world you're going to have trouble. 
But even though you have trouble in the world, you can have peace in me. They can coexist. While there is tribulation in the world, there can be peace in the mind and heart of a believer. Amen? In this world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. There's another time when the Bible puts cheer and trouble in the same verse. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Implying that if I have overcome the world, I will make you overcomers in me. In me you have peace. In the world you have trouble. Rejoice because I have overcome the world. Amen. The cheer is not in the trouble, but the cheer is in overcoming, and it is in our relationship with Jesus Christ. But God is not absent from the conflict that we face in, in our lives and in the world. As always, God is working in our trouble and through our trouble to help us overcome and in the process to be more like Him. His character is shaped in us as we go through fiery trials that purge out stuff in us that is not like God. All the Old Testament illustrations in Proverbs of silver and gold that are tried by fire like our faith that comes forth as pure gold. It is not destroyed by the fire. It is purified by the fire. Job thought about what happened after death. He said, there the wicked cease from troubling. And the weary be at rest. Job said it would be better for me to die. There's no bad guys there where I'm going to trouble me. And everybody that's weary will be resting. He sang a song when I was in Bible college. The wicked shall cease from troubling. and The weary shall be at rest. And all the saints of the ages sit at his feet and be blessed. God is working in us through the trouble in our lives. And through the right response to hardship that you're facing, Jesus is becoming stronger in your life. You're becoming more like Him. The Apostle Peter taught that after, after you suffer a while, He's going to make you perfect or mature. He's going, and I love these three words in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. He will establish you. In the King James, it doesn't say establish, but it means the same thing. He's going to establish you. He's going to strengthen you. And He's going to settle you. Jesus is at work in your life. And the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1 and 6. These verses are not on the screen on purpose. There's a lot of verses. Being confident of this very thing. That He that hath begun a good work in you. Will perform it or will complete it. Will continue to do it. Until the day of Jesus Christ. He's not going to abandon you halfway through. He brought us out of sin to bring us in to the land of promise. And ultimately to heaven. Amen. Amen. Romans 8 and 28. This is one of those most quoted verses. That we sometimes seem to think is not really right when we get in a problem. And we know. That all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose. I think it's true to say that not all things are good, but God works all things for good. Like Joseph would say to his brothers, you meant it unto me for evil, but God meant it unto me for good to save much people alive as it is this day. So no matter what you try to do, that's why we have the promise that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. The Bible said that the arrow that is shot toward us is turned around into the heart of the shooter. Amen. That the thing that was meant to destroy us will strengthen us. Amen. And then, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul said, In the very God of peace, sanctify you Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. In other words, he started it, he will finish it. 
So whatever you face in your life, you can face it with peace in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can face it with rejoicing that you will overcome whatever comes against you. And then I love Jude 1, 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. That doesn't mean to trip once in sin. That doesn't mean to get knocked down in the struggles of life. That just means to eternally fall. He's able to keep you from falling in your relationship with God, from falling away. And to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. And then he tells us how it's going to happen. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. Last Wednesday night, I taught on living with loss. And there may be times in your life when you feel like you can't get up and you can't go on. There may be times when you think you can't make it, but you can. I was thinking about Simon Peter when he saw Jesus walking in the water. He said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you on the water. And, and Jesus said, come. And, and so here goes Simon Peter. But you know, he took his eyes off Jesus. He saw the winds and the wave boisterous and beginning to sink. So when he took his eyes off the Lord and he looked at the storm, he lost his faith and he began to sink. But as Jesus always does and always will in your life, the Bible said while Peter was sinking that immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, of little faith, why did you doubt and when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. So when you make an attempt to live for God, and you just kind of fail and look at the storm and start to sink, don't think that the Lord is going to watch you go down and let you drown. He loves you. Amen. I think God is proud of us when we take a step of faith. Amen. That we can rebound. Praise God. We can have a spirit of resilience in us. Micah knew what it was like to sink into despair when he saw the decline of his culture. Micah is not a spiritual lightweight. He's not a weakling. He's not just an emotional, unstable, unspiritual, spiritual baby. Micah is a prophet. He's a man of God. And I say that. It really wasn't in my notes. But I thought of this as we were worshiping. Or maybe just before church. Perhaps it just came to me that I needed to let you know. That sometimes we think people who struggle are just weak. They're just not as spiritual as you are. But Micah is a strong man. Spiritually. He's a godly man. He's a prophet. But Micah is still struggling. Micah's name means who is like Jehovah. But when you read the book that bears his name, you might ask who in the world is like Jehovah except Micah. It doesn't look like many other people are. Micah tells us when he prophesied and why this book was written. The word of the Lord came unto Micah, the Morishite, in the days of Jotham Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. That's when he wrote. He is somewhat of a contemporary of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is considered a, my, a major prophet. Micah, because of its length, is considered a minor prophet. Just because of the length of the book. But there's somewhat contemporaries. And there's some similar phraseology in Isaiah and Micah. And he writes about Samaria and Jerusalem. And he tells them that God is witnessing against them. And God is going to come out of his place. He's going to judge them. Tread down the high places. The mountains are going to melt under him. The valleys are going to divide under him. And it's because of the transgressions of Jacob. Which is kind of a way of saying the people of God. Israel or, or Judah in this case perhaps. Because of their sins. And the Lord is going to judge them because of the way they're living. The capital of the northern tribes of, 
uh, in Samaria, in Jerusalem. There where these sins are being committed, both the northern and southern kingdoms. They've got graven images, and the Lord says they're going to beat down, be beat down by the judgments of God. So here's Micah. He's living in this time prior to the captivity. He's prophesying in times of intense social injustice that's going on. There's a lot of bad stuff happening in Micah's world. There are false prophets that are preaching for riches rather than because of righteousness. There are princes that thrive on cruelty and violence and corruption. There are priests that are ministering more for greed than they are for God. There are landlords that are stealing land from poor people and evicting destitute widows from their homes. This is happening in the book of Micah. There are judges that are lusting after bribes and perverting justice. There are businessmen that are using deceitful scales and wrong wages or weights rather to rip off their customers. If you're a business person and you use practices that are unethical and ungodly, that's a sin. I just thought I'd throw that in. Sin had infiltrated every segment of society. And a word from God was mandatory from the prophet Micah. So Micah, in his book, he enumerates the sins of the nation, sins that will ultimately lead to their destruction and captivity, you know, for 70 years. But in the midst of this darkness, Micah gives us, of course, this word of hope, that a divine deliverer will appear in Righteousness will ultimately prevail. And though justice is trampled underfoot, one day truth will triumph. Micah tells us that in this short book. Micah 7 is kind of the heart of the book. I want us to go to Micah 7. And Micah paints a really bleak picture of a man who's faced a major disappointments in his life. So I'll be reading, these verses are not all on the screen. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation just to kind of make it flow in modern terminology, this is what Micah said. How miserable I am. I'm like the fruit picker after the harvest. You can find nothing to eat. Not a cluster of grapes or a single early fig can be found to satisfy my hunger. The godly people have all disappeared. Not one honest person is left on the earth. Now let me just pause to say right here, Remember when, when Elijah felt that same way? Kind of a distorted perception of reality. In Micah's mind, there's not one, one. There's not one, Micah said. There's not one honest person left on the earth. Now you know that's not true. But Micah believes it fully in his mind. They are all murderers. Really? Setting traps even for their own brothers. Both their hands are equally skilled in doing evil. They're like the tribe of Benjamin. They can sling a stone with either hand. They can fight left-handed or right-handed. These guys are bad guys with both hands, Micah says. They're really skilled at doing evil. Officials and judges alike demand bribes. I mentioned some of these things kind of in an overview. The people with influence get what they want, and together they scheme to twist justice. Even the best of them is like a briar. The most honest is as dangerous as a hedge of thorns. But your judgment day is coming swiftly now. Your time of punishment is here. A time of confusion. And then Micah gives you some really good advice. Maybe not really. Micah says, don't trust anyone. Not your best friend or even your wife. For the son despises his father. The daughter defies her mother. The daughter-in-law defies her mother-in-law. Your enemies are right in your own household. I don't know about you, but that sounds like the book of Job almost, right? Just throw that over in Job and it fits right in. Moses, I mean Micah, you know, this, this society is living in, this culture is on a collision course with the judgments of God and calamity. 
Micah sees it coming. He's trying to preach to hold it back and bring the people to repentance. He's in despair, but, but he doesn't totally give up. And that's the heart of our text, Micah 7 and 8. In the King James, rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. Now when you go through the book and you read especially chapter 7, you know he's not just kind of speaking in hyperbole. He really believes, he sees these bad people. He lives among them. There are a lot of evil people in his world. They're all around him. They're his neighbors. In his mind, they're in his own house. You can't trust anybody. But then he says, rejoice not against me. O oh, mine enemy, when I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a, a light unto me. This is not a begging appeal by Micah. It's sort of a warning. You know, he's not kind of hunkering down and whimpering here. He's issuing a warning to his enemy. That no matter what you try to do to me, you can't keep me down. Amen. I envision the enemy of Micah, the en enemy of the people of God, at this point in his writing, you just kind of visualize what's going on. Micah is down, right? And visualize a boxing match. Micah's enemy has knocked Micah down. If you're me, it's his left hand that knocked him down. And the referee is going through the ten count. Now, I don't know how far he is into the count, but, you know, one... And they say it's not necessarily 10 seconds, but 10 counts. And Micah's enemy is strutting around the ring. And he's got both fists, both fists raised in the air. And he's so proud of himself. And the prophet Micah, Christian guy, you know, not back then, but godly guy. In the enemy's mind, he has destroyed Micah. But Micah, laying there while the referee is counting, is kind of wanting to say, don't print the t-shirts yet. Don't plan the party yet. Don't picture your picture in the news yet. What Micah says is, I may be down, but I am not out. And I want to say this to you today, that you need to make up your mind to have an attitude like Micah that says, Rejoice not against me, O oh mine enemy. I may not be feeling good right now. I may not be thinking clearly right now. It may look like everything is bad. But I want you to know that, that I may be down, but I shall arrive. I'm getting back up again. Now Micah does not say, if I fall. He says, when I fall. And once again, this does not imply that Micah is failing God in sin. I've already said this. I know that we can sin. We're capable of sin. And if we will repent, God will forgive us. But this is not talking about sin per se. It is talking about falling down under the attack of an enemy against him. Amen. And in the battle of life, none of us can say that we have never failed. None of us can say, only Jesus, that we've never lost a battle. That we've never taken a lick that not, did not knock us down. Micah does not pretend to be impervious to the pain of life. He is honestly encouraging us that when I fall, don't count me out. I shall arise. Amen? It doesn't matter how much the enemy has a sneer on his face, gloating over his assumed victory, glaring at the crowd, glaring down at Micah who is laying there. Amen? God will always give his people a way of escape, a way to rebound. We can be resilient in our spirit. Amen? For Micah's strength is surging through his body and resolve is returned to him. His jaw is set. His eyes are piercing. He is up. He stops the referee from his count. He is back in the fight again. Felt, yo, I fall. I will arise. Amen. I want to tell you that you can get back up again. That God can give you a resiliency in your spirit. That no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That you will always be able to get up one more time than you've been knocked back down. The righteous fall seven times and rise up again. Amen. We are made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. We were designed by God to be resilient.
praise God. And our story is like Micah's back on his feet, back in the fray, having his way with his opponent. Amen. Not Superman, but he serves a supernatural God. And he's not gloating in his own ability. He is gloating in what God can do. When I fall, I shall arise. Micah 7 and 8 on the screens again. I want to point to the next phrase. When I sit in darkness. The Lord, when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Now I told you I've taught this theme before, a lot of different material, but I just felt like I needed to just do this a little differently tonight. But, but I've, never, I've never really talked about when I sit in darkness. And several days ago as I was kind of thinking this through, praying about it, I felt like tonight I, I really needed to address what Micah said. It is part of this very famous verse, right? When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. So what is this darkness that Micah talks about? Rejoice not against me, though I fall, I shall arise. But now he's not laying on his back. He's sitting in darkness. It's another picture, a word picture. So Micah's world has gone dark. You remember chapter 7, I've read it? The power is off. Resources are drained. Can't find anything to eat. Righteous people can't be found anywhere. Not even one, he says. It's violence, hatred, evil, a corrupt justice system, bribes for judges. Micah lost all of his confidence in his friends, his counselors. He calls them guys. Felt like he couldn't even talk to his own spouse. He talks about families being fractured, you know, right? Don't trust anybody, daughter-in-law, mother-in-law, sister-in-law, all of that. And he said enemies aren't just on the outside, but they're, they're inside. You better watch. They're everywhere. And these conditions for Micah make for a very dark place for him. He's sitting, he's sitting and I visualize him sitting in stunned silence. He's sitting in darkness. It might be the darkness of despair, but things will never change. It might be the darkness of depression that has drained the life out of you. It may be the darkness of defeat, the feeling that you are a failure. It may be the darkness of isolation, that you are all alone. Maybe the darkness of financial duress that you're under right now. Micah felt like he had no place to turn. When he looked to the left, looked to the right, looked for a person to come to his rescue, there was nobody there. I think he felt like David did when he wrote Psalm 142.4. I looked on my right hand and behold, held and there was no man that would, that would even know me. Like they didn't even know, act like they knew who I was. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. There's no one around to help Micah. Micah's looking around in his culture, looking around in his house, looking around everywhere he can. And there doesn't seem to be any help coming from anywhere on a horizontal plane. So Micah 7.7, 7, we're backing up a verse. Therefore, Micah said, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. When Micah quit looking around and started looking up, he found faith. Again, it is in verse 7 when he looks up to God that there is inspiration for the famous verse 8. He looks up to God. He calls on the Lord and the Lord helps him. And then he finds this anointing to write and to say, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. 
when I said in darkness, amen, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I want to remind you of some scriptures in the Bible about light in a dark place. Darkness is kind of a metaphor often for depression or despair or a place of sickness or the valley of the shadow of death. And that darkness is, tends to be evil. But I want to remind you that when you sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light unto you. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Amen. Isaiah wrote, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath light shined. He's speaking of the coming of the Messiah. John would write in John 1, 4 and 5, In him was life, and the life was the light of man, men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not or could not extinguish it. Amen. The darkness could not stop it. It was the apostle Peter who spoke about the word of God. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you give heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. You may be in a dark place. Or you may go through a dark place. And sitting in darkness. But tonight I wanted to remind you. That you can have a resiliency of spirit. That though you fall, you can get up again. And though you sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to you. Amen. And I don't know what tomorrow holds or the next day or the rest of your life. But I know what eternity holds for you. Amen. And I wanted to remind you of that as well in Revelation 21, 25. And the gates of it, that holy city shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. In Revelation 22 and 5, And there shall be no night there, and no need, they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. When it comes to understanding the Bible, Paul writes about the gifts of the Spirit, He's talking about our incomplete understanding of everything. And Paul says, we see through a glass darkly. 1 Corinthians 13 and 12. For now, we see through a glass darkly. People who feel like they have perfect understanding of everything need to read this verse. Because this is speaking specifically, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, about the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. That no matter how those gifts operate, it's a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. It's not all knowledge. It's not all wisdom. It is always in part. We know in part. We prophesy in part. That's what we know. And we see through a glass darkly. But Paul said, but then, face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. I know that you may be praying for the circumstances to change in our world and in your life. And we all should pray that the circumstances would change in our world and in our lives. But though you sit in darkness, the Lord is coming. He is dispelling the darkness with the light of His Word, with the light of His presence. Amen. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. And those that live in the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. And tonight I want to encourage you that no matter how dark your circumstances may be, how dark our world may get, that God has given us a promise of new heavens, new earth. A place where there is no darkness, sickness, pain, sorrow, sadness, no sin, no enemy there. Amen. So why don't you let the resiliency of the Holy Ghost and the strength of the Word of God cause you, though you have fallen down, to rise up. 
Though you sit in darkness, let the Lord be a light unto you. Amen. If you believe that, would you stand to your feet? Would you lift your voice? How would you thank the Lord for the promises that are yes and in him they are. Amen.